When we first pick up photography, we'll usually just leave the camera in full auto, walk around and just enjoy the act of taking photos. However, after a while, we become curious what the M dial actually means on our cameras and sooner or later we want to find out what we're missing out on. Couple that with many pros telling you that real professional photographers know how to use a camera in manual so sooner or later you decide to dabble with full manual settings for your exposure. Initially you have no idea what's going on. Why are your photos overexposed? Why are they underexposed? Why is there some motion blur going on in your image? However after messing around for a while you figure it out, you have a system in place that you go to to get the right exposure and everything is well. However, from time to time, you can still get frustrated, especially if you need to take a photo quickly, you switch your camera on and then your settings are everywhere and you just don't really have it nailed down as well as you would like to. Well, in this video, I wanna share with you what I believe is a very efficient, very quick and a very methodical approach to manual exposure in photography. Oh, and just one important point before we begin. There is no such thing as correct settings. There is no such thing as best settings. I mean, sure, there are best practices, but generally speaking, there isn't one way to set up a camera for manual exposure. Anyone who tells you that is leading you down the wrong path. The healthiest way to approach this is to take everything I'm about to tell you, try it, and then pick out what you like, get rid of what you don't like, listen to other people, and try all of these things for yourself. Eventually, you will come to a system that works for you. Maybe it's completely my system that works for you. Maybe it's a combination of what I do and what someone else does. There is no one way of setting up your camera. There is no one way of taking photos, as long as you're getting to the end result that you want quickly and efficiently. Before getting into the details, let's first cover a few points which I think are very important to keep in mind as you watch this video. So first of all, there's a myth out there that somehow you need to know 100% how to expose manually to be a good photographer. That's not entirely true because knowing how to expose your camera does not automatically mean you know how to see good light, you know how to put together a good composition or to make an image, make an image, take an image that is interesting. There are many photographers who just use their iPhone in auto and don't even know the concept of manual settings, yet they create incredible work. And equally, there are people with, you know, six grand mirrorless cameras who can tell you every single setting backwards yet the best they can come up with is a photo of their cat in their garden. So the two don't always go hand in hand. However, being proficient in manual exposure means that when you do have the vision for good light, good composition, interesting subjects, then you know how to set up your camera to get the most out of those scenes and to really make that vision come to life. For example, if you want an out of focus foreground with some motion blur, you will know exactly where to put your shutter speed, where to put your aperture and what ISO you would need to balance everything out and make it work. Also being proficient in manual means you understand how your camera works and how it exposes. So if you do use automatic settings or semi-automatic settings, such as aperture priority, you can keep an eye on what the camera is doing and intervene if you think it's not doing something that you think should be done in a different way to get the results that you want. And finally, being proficient in manual means that you can completely take over when you're faced with very challenging light. So for example, fog, snow, or even nighttime photography can sometimes prove to be difficult for semi-automatic or automatic settings. And manual, in my opinion, is definitely better for those scenarios. Another way to put this is that if you know how to drive a manual car, it does not make you a better driver because you can know how to use a gearbox, but you might not be able to know what to do if the back of the car steps out on a slippery road. You might not know what to do if the steering starts to go light because you're understeering into a ditch. However, once you get your head around the basics of how a car behaves, then being able to change gears manually will just really elevate your skill as a driver because then you'll be able to prepare the car for the corner or for the situation that you're about to enter. And again, same with photography. Being able to shoot in manual doesn't make you a better photographer with regards to seeing light and subjects, etc. But once you can see light composition, subjects, etc., being able to shoot manually can help you prepare the camera for that condition a little bit better. 
Of course, there are some scenarios where manual is way better than semi-automatic. However, there are other scenarios where I would always choose aperture priority over manual any day of the week. I would suggest using manual when you are faced with challenging conditions such as fog, snow, or even nighttime photography. I would also use manual if the light is consistent. If you're shooting, let's say, in the desert on a bright day, then you might as well leave it in manual because you know the light is not changing. Or even if you're shooting on an overcast day and everything's sort of gray and gloomy, as long as, as long as the light doesn't always change, manual just makes things a little bit easier. When you're shooting for a specific type of photo, such as motion blur, or to try and freeze very fast motion. When you want to really slow down and be very thoughtful and methodical with your approach to photography. So the process of photography is more important than the end result. And finally, when you really must have all the control over your scene. So for example, if you see a nice, you know, high contrast scene in the city, you expose for the highlights, let the shadows fall to black, and then you just chill, and wait for the right subject to come in. For that type of scenario, manual is obviously way better than any aperture priority or shutter priority type setting. I wouldn't recommend using manual for the following scenarios. So first of all, when you're faced with ever changing light, a good example of that is if you're going in and out of, let's say, markets on a sunny day, one minute it's full brightness and midday, next minute you're somewhere a little bit darker, and then there's pockets of light everywhere. So if you find you're always changing your settings, this could be a good time to flick it into aperture priority. Second one is if you are in a fast paced environment where getting the shot is more important than the process. So for example, you're driving through a town you've never been to, you might not come back to again, and you are taking photos out the car window. Well, in that case, aperture priority is way ahead of manual because it saves you a ton of headaches and things to think about and you can just focus on getting the good shot. And finally, if your attention is split between photography and something else. So for example, if I'm out with friends, if I'm out with family or I'm traveling with family, then I'll just leave it in aperture priority because at the end of the day, I don't want to be just sitting there always you know, focusing on the settings and not enjoying the moment. I'd rather just let the camera do its thing, put it to like F4 or something and forget about it. In this section, we'll quickly cover the settings of each parameter, and then later in the video, we'll bring it all together and talk about the methodology of why I select these settings. ISO is usually the first thing that I set. So for bright, sunny days when the light is not changing, I will just put it to base. So let's say I'm walking through a park or a desert, and there's constant good light, base is more than enough. If I'm on an overcast day or a cloudy day, and again, the light doesn't change all too much, I will re uh, re raise the ISO a little bit to 320. If I do find myself in a position, as I've mentioned earlier, where the light is constantly changing, you're in and out of buildings, you're in and out of markets, it's sunny, it's, there's some shadow, then I would put it to anywhere between 320 and 500, just depending on the light. The next thing I would set is the aperture. So my go-to aperture setting is f4 because I believe it's the best kind of mid-ground with regards to the entire aperture range of a typical lens. The reason for it is because at f4 you do have a bit of background blur so you get a bit of separation but it's not too much that you just lose context because everything is completely blown out. Also, because you're not wide open, the lens is usually a little bit sharper, a few stops above from wide open. You are still letting plenty of light in, but also you are cutting a little bit of the light out. And finally, because you're in the middle, if you do need to make any emergency adjustments that I'll talk about later, you can go either way on the aperture range. In some cases, I would open the lens up even more to f2 or f1.4 when I am faced with either very low light or I want to increase the amount of background or foreground blur. So if the scene opens up, then I can drop it down, or if I want the softest possible image. On the other hand, I will close it down to F8 if I want to cut a lot of the light out. So let's say it's June midday, so much sun's coming in. So F8 cuts a lot of it out. Obviously, if I want to have more in focus with regards to foregrounds to background relationship, and if I want to have the sharpest possible setting, because most lenses are at their sharpest roughly in the middle of the aperture range. Sometimes I'll go to f11, not very often, 
and anything above that, I tend to stay away. Last but not least is the shutter speed. Personally, I like to keep it at around one over 500 or above. In my experience, I've just found for a run and gun style of photography like I do, one over 500 is enough to pretty much reduce most motion blur within reason. Anything below that, you do increase the risk of motion blur. However, if you're the type of photographer who just takes their time, you stand still, you'll hold your breath, you'll put the camera up to your eye and take a photo, you can get away with a lower shutter speed. I would say anything one over 250 or above, you're good. And finally, my maximum shutter speed is usually one setting below the maximum of the camera. So the XD4 goes up to one over 8,000. Therefore, I will usually stick to one over 4,000 as my maximum. Simple reason is I always want to have one extra click in reserve for emergencies. Having done countless workshops, one of the most common frustrations that I will hear from people and from you guys if you're watching is that your photos come out blurry. Now, in some cases, it is to do with focusing, but honestly, 80% of the time, it's to do with the fact that shutter speeds that are being used are just way too low. And when I ask why are you using such a low shutter speed, the most common answer, as you can expect, is to keep the ISO down to base, therefore to have the cleanest image possible. And honestly, I completely understand why, because the moment we start researching online about shooting in manual, Almost everyone always talks about that you need to keep your ISO as low as possible and ideally at base. And in many cases, even with cameras in auto settings, they would rather reduce the shutter speed than increase the ISO. Now, just very quickly, I don't want to go down the whole rabbit hole of at what ISO are photos acceptable with regards to noise. All I can say on that is from my experience using a cropped sensor Fuji camera and editing in Lightroom, so everyone always complains about the worms and extra noise and all that, between 160, 500, even 800 ISO, you're not gonna see any real world difference. That is worth even mentioning. So if your biggest worry is having a bit of extra noise by taking your ISO from base to around 5, 600, honestly, I wouldn't worry about it. The second issue that many people have when it comes to manual photography is that when they need to change settings, if the lighting conditions change, they are always trying to change everything. They don't know what to change first, they don't know if it's aperture or shutter speed or ISO. And what usually happens is they try and change all of them all at the same time. And at best, they miss the shot. At worst, they just get really frustrated because they're overexposed and they're missing everything in front of them and they're just standing there just trying to change settings uh, profusely. So as you can see, we're dealing with two issues here. The first one being shutter speeds being too low, therefore increasing the risk of motion blur. And the second one is trying to adjust every single setting possible at the same time and in turn missing the shot or just completely ruining the exposure. And this is where a slightly raised ISO comes into play. By keeping the ISO higher when the lighting conditions change, all you're doing is you're giving yourself more headroom with the shutter speed. So let's say, for example, you're walking down the street, right? You got ISO 500, you have F4 aperture, and your shutter speed is around one over 2000 because it's sunny. You quickly take a turn into a dark market, and all of a sudden you see a cool photo. Well, all you need to do is just drop your shutter speed to around one over 500, and just like that, you're exposed very quickly whilst maintaining a high shutter speed. Then you walk further down, you're back outside, it's bright sunny day, and then you quickly close your aperture down to let's say one over two and a half thousand, and you're back exposed very quickly for the conditions. Honestly, I've had days where I would walk around London and my aperture and my ISO will just stay glued at F4 and 500, and my entire exposure sort of just went between one over 250 when it got really dark and one over 4,000 when it got really bright. And by doing this, you are effectively taking two adjustments out of the picture and you are doing all the exposure adjustment just on the shutter speed. At this point, you might ask, well, that's all great, but what happens if it's just too dark or too bright? Well, don't forget that your aperture is at f4. If it's too dark and you're already down to, let's say, 1 over 400 shutter speed, you just open up the aperture. Or if it's too bright, do the opposite, close the aperture. Equally, because you're at ISO 500, you still have room either way and maintain a fairly clean image. If it's just that dark, 
just boost it to 1000. If it's that bright, drop it back down to base. In my personal experience, I found that 70 to 80% of the time, I didn't need to do that. I just messed around with the shutter speed. However, for the 20 or 30% times when I did have to do that, it was you know, only what, a second slower to just quickly open up the lens. And that basically saved so much hassle and so many headaches because I had a system for how to adjust manual exposure. So to summarize, this particular way of using manual exposure not only makes sure that shutter speed is consistently maintained high enough to reduce the risk of motion blur, but also it means that for maybe 70 to 80% of exposure adjustment is done on the shutter speed and ultimately on one dial. And for the remainder 20, 30%, you can quickly have either way uh, of adjustment on your aperture and your ISO. Now, can you do this, but with another parameter? So for example, can you lock shutter speed and aperture and then do the same on the ISO? Of course you can. In my experience, I just found that the shutter speed adjustment was, what's the word I'm looking for? More efficient than using ISO or aperture adjustment and the other parameters being locked. As I've said at the start of this video though, this is purely my approach to manually exposing a camera and your mileage may vary. You might try this method and you just can't get on with it. However, every time I showed this method in my one-to-one -one workshops in London, people usually found it very intuitive. And I just wanna wrap this video up with one last bit of advice, and that is to make any exposure adjustments before you walk into a new location where the light is different. So for example, if we're walking down the street and then we turn down a dark alleyway, change the exposure as soon as you notice the change in light. Because if someone comes out and you wanna take a cool photo, by the time you switch the camera on, by the time you see, oh, it's underexposed, let me just quickly drop the shutter speed, you might have missed the moment. So it's something that used to catch me out all the time. And now I make a conscious decision to double check my exposure every time the ambient lighting changes. So that's it, that's all for this video. I hope you have found it useful. If you found any value in this video, please give it a like. If you have your own thoughts and comments, please write them down below. And that is all. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day. Um, also, if you are on Twitter, go follow me on Twitter because I am posting pretty much my entire catalog of images because obviously I've never used to sh I never used to share on Twitter before, now I do. So if you wanna see loads of images from like three, four years ago, I am slowly posting them one by one. But anyway, I digress. Thank you and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.